Welcome on in everybody. Welcome back to Naturalist Training. Uh, it's nice to see some actual faces there. Uh, some people have their cameras on. Um, tonight we have Ron Danderhoff. We will be learning all about plants. Ron is one of the leading experts on both native and invasive plants uh, here in Orange County and around the Bay. Um, he is a board member with the California Native Plant Society, and he's also the general manager of Rogers Gardens. Um, so a big warm welcome to Ron Vanderhoff. Hello, good to see you all. Let me uh, get my screen up here. Give me just a second. Okay, can everybody hear me? Just give me a wave. All right, I got away from a few people. So I think if some can hear me, you can all hear me. Well, thank you. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, four or five years now that we've done this and uh, it's exciting. Uh, Newport Bay is one of the really cool places in all of Southern California and particularly in Newport Beach and in our area. And you guys are a great group. So we're gonna spend the next couple of hours talking a little bit about the plant life at Upper Newport Bay and a little bit kind of in a general sense around the Orange County area, but really uh, Newport. And uh, what I'll do is I'll stop periodically and uh, take a few questions or comments on anything that I said that you um, have a question about or disagree with or, um, or want to elaborate on. So um, try to hold those. I'm going to probably keep most of you muted uh, until those sections, just so that we don't have too much background noise. So I apologize for that. Um, if you have a burning question or you just want to cue one up, you can put it into the chat and I'll kind of try to glance at it once in a while and especially when we do our breaks and try to answer those um, as we go. So let me do one more thing here. Just get my chat showing on my screen. All right, okay, here we go. And we'll take a break um, halfway or so and let you stretch or get a drink or use the restroom or whatever you need to do. Whoops. Okay, so tonight, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the plants, uh, particularly um, a little bit about Orange County plant life and uh, can you, am I loud enough? Barbara, am I loud enough? Okay. Um, a little bit about Orange County plant life, some taxonomy, some botany, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about the plant communities, primarily just those that are represented at Newport Bay, uh, because that's how we're gonna understand plants is through communities. And then mostly we're gonna be spending our time on that third section, and that's talking about certain specific plants because that's really where it's the most fun and probably where you want to spend your time. So we'll talk about some of the characteristic plants at Newport Bay and, and, uh, and we'll talk about them a little bit. Um, a reminder that there's a second half to this and uh, Chuck, I know you're on the, the video tonight. Uh, Chuck Nichols is going to lead a virtual field trip Saturday morning. So be sure you're back on board for that. Uh, I believe that starts at nine o'clock for a couple of hours this Saturday. Okay, so plants in Orange County, we have about 1,450 plants. This number was is a little bit outdated. It's gonna get revised next year, a new county checklist is being worked on right now and it'll be published probably toward the middle or later part of next year. So we're a little higher than that right now, but that's kind of the Orange County wildland plant uh, number. 
Uh, we've got about 800 or uh, actually about 900 native species uh, in that grouping and about 550 or so that are invasive and non-native. So that's kind of what it looks like from a county perspective. Just at Newport Bay, which is a very small area, uh, we have almost 600 different species represented in a very small footprint. So a really, really important part of the flora of our area. And at Newport Bay, looking at that number again, we actually have more non-native species um, out there than we have native species, which isn't surprising. It's surrounded by urban uh, horticulture and landscape and, and so on. So a lot of things tend to move into the bay and the Newport Bay Conservancy and CDFW and, and everybody else tries to push them back out of the bay. And so it's a constant back and forth. Um, so there's Orange County, 506,000 acres. Newport Bay is about a thousand acres or so. A tiny little sliver of Orange County, but it has almost 40% of all of the species in the county represented. So it's a great place to go study plant material. Orange County as a whole is represented primarily by annuals and perennials. Um, we're a Mediterranean climate. That's very characteristic of Mediterranean plant communities. We tend to have um, a low count of tree cover. We're mostly shrubs and annuals, including grassland plants. Uh, we have a little sliver of woody vines, but mostly annuals and perennials are our main plant components in our area. Tonight, this is sort of all of the plants of phenological table of um, all the vascular plants. And tonight we're really only going to talk about the flowering plants, which is that bottom rectangle. It's what most of you will probably be thinking of when you think of the plants of Newport Bay. Um, you're thinking of the uticots and the monocots, which are the more well-known and characteristic plants. With that said, we do have two or three species of ferns in the bay. We have no Gymnosperms. Gymnosperms are pines and conifers and spruce and things like that. At least no native gymnosperms. We do have a couple of invasive pines that have seeded in. Uh, we have two magnoliids, which are, uh, we'll mention at least one of them. Oh, pardon me, one magnoliid in the bay. We'll mention one of them. And, but most of our talk tonight are going to be around what are called uticots and monocots. Uh, which are the flowering plants of um, our area. And just to separate that a little bit of botany, just so you have some perspectives on these, we divide the flowering plants into these two groups, um, monocots and uticots. They used to be called dicots. We don't use that term anymore. The monocots, have seeds that have two parts. They're called cotyledons. They're, um, they're two-parted seeds where monoco... Uh, uh, oh, I have that slide backwards. Look at that. Okay, well, you got to flip that title up there. I'll have to fix that for next time. Uh, it should say unicots and monocots. So um, we're looking at this in reverse. Sorry about that. Um, so... Um, Uticots have flower parts that are in fours or fives. It's an easy way to know what you're looking at. If you have, if you count five petals, it's almost certainly a uticot, where monocots have flower parts that are in threes. So if you look at, if you look at an, a lily or an orchid, um, you're gonna see that you have parts in threes, where most of your other flowering plants are in fours or fives. Um, if you cut a stem or a trunk of a plant and examine it, uticots have concentric rings, much like we learned in young, as young adults 
in school, you can count those rings to some degree and age the plant um, because of the way they grow, where monocots have an irregular structure in their vascular tissues. Um, you, they, don't, they don't produce concentric rings as they grow. And looking at the venation of plants, monocots have their leaves primarily in parallel veins, where eudicots you have a net um, habit. So it's an easy way to distinguish. And if you're leading natural history groups through the bay or doing interpretation for the public, it's a nice thing to point out some of the distinctions between these two groups. The monocots comprise all of your grasses, your lilies, your orchids, bamboos, and things like that, where um, unicots are basically everything else. The showier plants are often unicots, with the exception of lilies and orchids and such. Um, it's also nice to know a little bit about flower anatomy just so you can explain things to people. Um, flower, um, flowering plants have uh, basically male parts and female parts. And looking at this simplistic diagram of a generic plant, the female parts are right down the center of the photograph or the diagram rather. So right in this area um, and that in, collectively is called the pistil. The pistil includes the stigma where the pollen enters and the style or the tube, which the pollen goes down and then the ovary, which eventually becomes the seed, the fruit and, and the seed. Uh, those are all female parts of a flower. Um, on the right-hand side there, the, the group called the stamen, which includes the anther and the filament, that composes the male parts of a flower, most importantly, the pollen. And so the pollen sits on top of that anther when it's ripe and it needs to get transferred from the anther to the stigma in order for pollination to happen and for that plant to reproduce sexually. And how it gets from the anther to the stigma is generally through wind or an insect and different plants have different mechanisms for that to happen. Um, so um, moving from uh, moving that pollen um, from one to the other. Generally plants have adaptations to avoid the pollen getting moved from the anther to the stigma of the same flower. Um, that doesn't create outcrossing and that doesn't create good genetics in the plant. So usually we want the pollen to move from the anther of one flower to the stigma of a flower on a different plant. And there's lots of little strategies that plants incorporate for that to happen, um, including these two not being ripe at the same time. When the pollen is ready, the stigma often is not receptive on that particular flower. And that avoids self-pollination, which is as healthy as uh, cross-pollination. So those are the, the, the female parts of the flower, the pistil down the center and the male parts of the flower, the stamen, which includes the anther, which, in, which holds the pollen. Down at the base is the fruiting parts um, where uh, seed and fruit will develop eventually. So there you go, female parts, male parts, and pretty much all flowers um, can be uh, demonstrated this way. So more interesting, not more interesting, but also interesting is um, how certain plants are arranged in their sexual habits, their reproductive habits. And so Probably the most common arrangement is what are called bisexual flowers or bisexual plants where you have male and female parts on the same flower. And the majority of plants probably fall into this group. Um, the um, other two 
manners in which plants can be divided according to the reproduction is whether they're uh, dioecious or monoecious. So a dioecious species uh, means that you have male and female plants. The, the, the flowers on a dioecious plant will either all be male or all be female. And um, examples of those at the bay would be the baccarus, the, the brooms, uh, which are pretty well known. Um, when you're looking at one, if it's in flower, you'll see that the flowers are either all male or all female on that particular plant. Willows are another uh, good example uh, where you'll have uh, a plant will be either a male plant or a female plant, but you won't have male and female flowers on the same plant. So those are dioecious plants, and that's an adaptation to encourage what I mentioned in the last slide, and that is cross-pollination, that the plant doesn't pollinate itself. And then monoecious plants are sort of a halfway approach to that, where you have male and female flowers on the same plant, but you don't have male and female parts on the same flower. And that is also an adaptation to increase uh, genetic diversity and pollen movement from plant to plant. And examples of that at the bay would be like um, a well-known plant like a cattail. A cattail has a female uh, portion of the flower, that's the big enlarged um, sausage-like growth. And then right above that is the male uh, flowers, which are less showy, but that's where the pollen is produced. And um, both male and female flowers are on that plant, but they're in different locations and not in the same flower. Um, a common garden plant would be corn. Uh, a lot of you grow corn and the, the fruit is uh, held below the tassels, which are the male part. And then the fruit, the corn fruit is the female uh, uh, flower, or uh, the female portion of the plant. So that's about enough on uh, sort of plant anatomy. Plant naming is important. It's much like other naming of, of uh, living organisms, but a little bit different. And so tonight and in general, we're gonna be using a lot of botanical names. And it's important to at least have a basic knowledge on how, those, how that naming structure works. It's called a binomial system. And it's the same system that's used essentially for all life on, on Earth. Uh, so we have a two names, a, a, a two word system. The first word in the plant name is the genus. The second word is the species. The genus is a collection of species. So in this example of a bay plant, we have Centromedia as the genus and Perii as the species. When those two words are used in combination, it refers to a unique organism that no other organism on the planet will share. So central media perii is a um, specific plant that if you were to use that name in China or Orange County or South America, um, whoever you're talking to would know exactly what you're talking about. And it only refers to one taxa in the world. Unlike the common name, which um, we also use and easy to communicate, especially to the general public and to novices and so on, uh, common names have no taxonomic standing and there is no organization to those common names. You can start calling a plant any common name you want. You can put it in a book. You can put it onto a website. You can put it in the paper. And there's nobody that is going to be able to fact check that because they're, they're, um, 
there is no really uh, standardization to naming of common plants. So they can be a little, a little tricky. You want to be a little bit careful um, using common names with too much abundance because common names can refer to often several different plants, uh, where the botanic name is always plant specific. It, it never refers to more than one plant. Um, to make it a little bit more complex, the botanical or scientific name often, or occasionally I should say, will have a third word in its, in its train. And that third word is either a variety, pardon me, a subspecies, a variety, or a horticultural cultivar. And a lot of plants at the bay um, have um, a subspecies uh, as well as a genus and a species. So sometimes you'll see um, a plant with three words in their name and that third word is usually the subspecies, occasionally the variety and rarely the cultivar. Cultivar is really reserved for garden plants, not wildland plants. Um, so be aware of that. You might see a third word, uh, but usually, um, you'll, in fact, you'll always see um, two words. And that's, um, that's it for plant naming and plant nomenclature. By the way, lizards and fungi and single cell organisms and human beings have the same binomial system. We are, we are Homo sapiens. Homo is our genus. Sapiens is our, genus, is our species. Uh, so plants are, are uh, not unique in that regard. Okay, we're going to pretty quickly here get into looking at some plants. That's about as much as I want to do with my time on kind of general botany. I know that's very brief, but, um, but I think plants is where we want to spend most of our time. We're going to talk about plants in terms of communities. And those are associations of plants that are collected in an area based on a fairly uh, distinctive vegetation type. Um, and at the Bay, we have about four or five uh, plant communities, maybe five or six. Let's just go right into some of those. Here's a little bit more about plant communities. They tend to be organized around soil, rainfall, slope, um, the aspect the, of, of uh, which direction that slope is facing, elevation, um, heat, and even um, human-induced things such as invasives and fire and erosion. In Orange County, we have approximately those plant communities. The top six are represented at least to some degree at the bay. And there's a community at the bottom called Rutteral. Rutteral is really just waste areas. It's plants that are growing in highly disturbed areas. But, um, uh, and those are collectively just called rural areas. So really wildland communities, we have those top six and we're gonna walk through them. The first one that we're gonna talk about is what's called the coastal strand. And the coastal strand is basically the beaches of Orange County, the sandy habitats just above the waterline but below any bluffs or cliffs. It also includes dunes. We don't really have dunes at the bay. We have them out on Balboa Peninsula and a few other places at Crystal Cove and such. Um, but the coastal strand would include those if they were present at the bay. So it's the sandy area right above the, the surf for the most part. And those areas as well as several others are characterized by a lot of salt, both in the soil and the air, um, a sandy environment that's very dynamic, that's constantly in motion, uh, wind and 
uh, and even uh, occasional king tides and so on will, will change that environment. It's a very windy environment, got lots of wind almost constantly. So plants are adapted in ways to those environments. They're very deep rooted. They're not very cold tolerant. It's, it's a low frost, zero frost environment. Lots of succulents. They're almost, well, they're always herbaceous. There's really no trees in this environment. Uh, they're evergreen and they're very low because of the constant wind that's blowing across them. Those are some of the indicator plants that you've been, that you're looking at. And let's look at pictures of that around the county. So coastal strand are those photographs at the left at Sunset Beach and San Clemente. We've got a little bit of dune habitat there at Sunset Beach and at San Clemente, uh, really just a coastal uh, beach. And at Upper Newport Bay, we have maybe some marginal uh, coastal strand um, over on the north side of the bay, not far from Coast Highway. Uh, but it's not really very well developed, but, um, but a tiny bit. Uh, some of the plants are those. We're not going to talk about all of those, uh, but those are some of the characteristic plants that you may have seen either at the bay or in other places. And let's look at a few of them that are pretty characteristic here at Newport Bay. Um, this one is a non-native, but it's very common. It's called Kakil Murdama or sea rocket. By the way, my little code there, if you see the little asterisk after the botanic name, that means it's not native. It's a naturalized plant, but nonetheless, it's part of the environment. So I want you to know it. Um, and it has fleshy leaves. It's named sea rocket based on the fruit that's there at the bottom left. It looks like a little missile or a little rocket in profile. And the fruit's on the plant much of the year. Um, so you'll see it. It's a member of the mustard family. And the second plant, back to that one again. So um, low, low and spreading, low and sprawling plant, somewhat juicy succulent leaves, which is common of these plants in this environment. And it's very weedy, um, very common in this environment. Another non-native, but one that we all know, uh, unfortunately, is our sea fig. It's our perennial ice plant that's quite common. Um, it's a South African plant. We actually have two species in the bay uh, and they're, they're shown there at the right. They're very hard to tell apart and they're really, it's not really important to tell them apart. Um, but one of them has sharp angles and one of them has a rounded angle and cross section on the far right if you, if you really wanna know the difference. Um, they're really bad news. They're, uh, they bind soil quite well, but they uh, pretty much crowd out any native uh, component and, of course, support really no biodiversity or pollinators or uh, any other organisms, very little. A native plant that used to be um, a little bit, well, pretty much where the ice plants are now is saltgrass, the spiclus, spicata. Saltgrass looks a lot like Bermuda grass to novices, um, but grows in a, even a more salty environment. It grows in dunes and upper portions of beaches that haven't been trampled by beachgoers and surfers and such. Um, it is interesting in that it's a dioecious plant that we mentioned earlier. Um, so it has um, either a male, each plant that you're looking at is either a male plant or a female plant. And the photographs at the right, the bottom right shows the flower of um, the male plant on the far left and the female plant on the far right. And if you were to take a lens to that and look at it more closely, you would see some of the differences. 
pollen only is on the plant on the left, there's no pollen on the right, and ovaries are only on the right-hand plant, the plant on the left doesn't have those structures. Um, so very good at binding soil, very deep rooted, um, stabilizes the dunes, um, it provides cover for some of the dune um, reptiles and lizards and insects. Um, and still fairly, fairly common and fairly abundant, um, even at the bay. Let's do another plant community or two, and then we'll pause and I'll answer a question or two or a comment. Um, so the coastal salt marsh is probably the most iconic plant community at the bay. And when you're talking to groups uh, or, um, or leading uh, people through the bay or interpreting the bay, this is probably where you're going to stop and spend a little bit more time than most others. Just because it's a unique environment. It's not a very common environment anymore along our California coast. 90% of it has been lost. Uh, we have fragments of it left. And in Orange County, Upper Newport Bay represents the largest healthy intact habitat of coastal salt marsh. Um, so how, what's, what is it? If they're low areas, estuaries and other wetlands immediately in proximity to the coast and they have a tidal interaction. So they have um, tidal movement. They haven't been closed off to the ocean. The tide still is allowed to enter and, and leave twice a day. Um, and the plants are adapted in, in, in many cases require that tidal movement for a healthy plant community. In Orange County, the most obvious examples are at Upper Newport Bay and at Bolsa Chica. And you probably know both, of, well, you certainly know Upper Newport Bay. The distinction between Upper Newport Bay and Bolsa Chica is that Upper Newport Bay is actually an estuary salt marsh in that an estuary has freshwater flow into its waters where Bolsa Chica has very little fresh water flow other than occasional rain events that uh, bring some fresh water to it. There is no normal fresh water movement in, into Bolsa Chica. So Bolsa Chica is not an estuary, it's a salt marsh where Upper Newport Bay is of course a salt marsh, but it's also an estuary. The main Freshwater flow is from San Diego Creek Channel, but there's also freshwater flow from Big Canyon, Delhi Channel, and a few other channels. A lot of that freshwater flow is now from urban runoff. Uh, normally that flow would be seasonal, um, but in the last hundred years or, or less, it's now a year round flow from urban irrigation. Nonetheless, it, Upper Newport Bay is an estuary. So a lot of the same characteristics of uh, the coastal strand, very salty, high pH, um, lots of flooding uh, and fog and, and salt air. The adaptations that we have halophytes, I'll mention halophytes more in a few minutes. Those are salt adapted plants. Also lots of succulents in the foliage. Succulent foliage is an adaptation to drought. So we have um, immense drought in these environments. Even though water is a few meters away, um, the plants can't use that water in many cases. So uh, lots of adaptations to drought, meaning succulents. They're not very cold tolerant. They're also low in profile and they're evergreen. A lot of the same adaptations. Um, indicator plants that tell you you're in a salt marsh are these, but we'll look at them in a minute. 
So what does a salt marsh look like? You already know what it looks like. It looks like this. Uh, intertidal areas that are inundated periodically and then dry down and then inundated and dry down in a recurring, never ending pattern. Here's Bolsa Chica, not an estuary, but nonetheless a salt marsh and shares a lot of the same plants. So characteristic plants. Well, we'll start off with one of the more important ones at Upper Newport Bay, and that's Spartina, Pacific cord grass. And it looks like this. It's a true grass, even though it um, lives in mudflats and salt marshes. Um, it's a perennial grass. It tends to brown out as it looks in the far bottom right part of your screen. It browns out during the cool winter months and then it greens up during the warm half of the year. It flowers in late spring and early summer. And it's a very important plant to a very important bird called a Ridgeway rail which really requires this habitat for its nesting. Uh, the rails, which I think you're probably all familiar with, are a protected and endangered bird. And uh, Upper Newport Bay is one of their more important um, areas of residence and breeding. A second very, very common plant that you'll see in large expanses is called saltwort or batis. It looks sort of like an ice plant from either up close or even from a distance. It's a very succulent plant. Um, it grows, as all of these do, in very salty environments with its feet in water most of the time. And I thought I had another picture. I don't. But the, the leaf, if, I, if you could see it, is um, very rounded, elliptical, and very succulent, much like a small leafed ice plant. Uh, the flowers are inconspicuous. Okay, the flowers are inconspicuous. Uh, and it usually has a pale color, almost a, a yellow green. Uh, when you're looking at it in the distance. It's easy to point out when you're looking across the marsh. It's easy to tell um, by that color of its foliage. It's a yellow green rather than a, a deep uh, forest green or an apple green even. Another succulent plant that covers large areas of the bay in the intertidal zone is Jamia. It's a member of the daisy family. And if you look at the image there um, on the bottom, uh, it shows the daisy-like flower. Uh, it has a succulent leaf and it's a sprawling plant with um, its feet in the wet mud most of the time as well. Very common, easy to see along Back Bay Drive, uh, just walking along, you'll see it. It's still in bloom at this time of the year. I was just at the bay a few hours ago and uh, taking some photographs of it. So uh, easy to notice when it is in bloom, it's, there's nothing else quite like this. And then the other characteristic plant of the bay, somewhat iconic, like the Spartina or cord grass, are all of our pickle weeds. And we have three pickle weeds at Upper Newport Bay. Um, they're shown there across the top and bottom. Uh, we have one annual species, which is the top left photograph. That's Salicornia biglovii. And that one grows and dies every year. So it seeds, it grows, it flowers, it reproduces, it drops its seed, and then it disappears during the winter and reappears as the water and the soil warm up in the spring. The uh, other two on the right are very similar and difficult for a lot of people to tell apart. 
they grow to some degree together um, and they have a very similar leaf. Actually, all three have a similar leaf, but the two on the far right have a similar growth habit. They're slightly woody and sprawling and form these mounds in the, in the mud or slightly above. Uh, between the two, you can tell the, uh, the far right species by having a narrower leaf and a finer texture. Uh, and it tends to grow a little bit higher. Um, doesn't usually have its feet in the water. Uh, even during high tide, it's often slightly above that, where the species in the middle, Salicornia pacifica, often will be a, a meter or two closer to the water, but they'll intermingle. Um, so those are our, our pickle weeds. And they form large areas, usually in the medium to higher intertidal areas um, of the bay. Uh, let's see if I, what else I have here. Okay. Alkali heath or Frankinia. Um, we're kind of moving up a little bit in elevation. So this one also will occasionally have its feet near the water, near the highest tide zone, but will move a little further up. It'll move up into the bluff areas a little bit. It'll, it'll climb up fence posts like we see here. Um, and it has um, a little pink flower that's really very small, smaller than a dime, probably a centimeter, or maybe a little more in diameter. It's in its own family called Frankiniaceae. I really like nothing else. It's not really succulent um, and kind of nondescript, but very, very common. Um, Big Canyon at Back Bay has lots and lots of it. Uh, it handles salty alkaline soils that are a little drier than the pickle weeds and some of the other salt marsh plants. So they'll it'll be on the upper ends of the salt marsh and merging into the coastal sage scrub. And I, a characteristic plant that a lot of people see at the bay is, is this one. It's one of our daughters, Cascada. And this one's Cascada Pacifica. We have five different daughters at Orange County. This is the most likely one to be seen at the bay. And you'll see this orange hair like plant growing out in the coastal salt marsh. It'll grow on the pickle weeds, it'll grow on the battus, on the jamia, it'll grow on ice plants and a few other species. It's a natural part of the plant community. It's not an invasive, it's not a bad guy, it's a it's a natural part of the community. So um, People will often see it and go, oh, what's that? We need to report that or we need to tell somebody about it. It's, we need to get rid of it. It's causing problems. It's not, it's, it's a natural member of the plant community. It is a parasite. Not all parasites are bad guys. Um, it is, it's parasitic. It doesn't have any chlorophyll. It's reliant completely on its host. Uh, it's a member of the morning glory family. It does have a flower, as seen in a couple of those pictures, and it pollinates and grows to some degree like any other plant. It produces a seed. That seed drops to the ground. It germinates. It doesn't have any chlorophyll, so it very quickly has to attach to a host. Usually within about a week or two, it has to find a host that it can connect to. It'll put little uh, organs into its host, just enough to extract some nutrient and water. Uh, those are called Hastoria. They're little suction-like organs that attach itself to the host. And then it very quickly disconnects from the soil. Um, so it germinates, it grows for a couple of weeks, it looks for a host, if it finds one, it disconnects and it lives the rest of its year growing on its host. If it doesn't find a host, it perishes and um, that's the end of that seed.
And then it grows the rest of summer and then the fall on top of its host, getting its moisture and its nutrient from the host, but not causing really much stress on the host, doesn't um, have much of an adverse impact. But it's very noticeable in this, um, this orange hair-like growth. If you do hiking in the chaparral and in the coastal sage scrub, you'll see other species that grow on in those areas. This is our salt marsh species, Cascada Pacifica. So it's, it's a good guy. One of the most important species I'd like you to learn at the marsh is this one. It's called Chloropyron meridimum. Salt marsh bird's beak is the easier name. And it's a California and United States protected species. It has endangered species status. Um, and Upper Newport Bay is a stronghold for it. We have some very healthy populations. It grows out in the intertidal area and it can be fairly easily seen at the right time of the year. Uh, an easy place to see it is at the Science Center at the beginning of Back Bay Drive, the CDFW um, Center, uh, right along the access road just to the right in the marsh. And best time to look for it is around May, June, July, um, where you'll see these whitish yellow tip flowers. And it's pretty easy to spot. It'll be growing out amongst the, the marsh uh, in the intertidal area. Another easy place to see it is right near Big Canyon, uh, it, adjacent to the large parking lot that's there. Uh, if you walk um, right along uh, Back Bay Drive going north, uh, up Back Bay Drive, and once you cross the, uh, the waterway that releases the water from Back Bay, start looking to your left and you'll see large patches of it all through the, the marsh. Um, one of the, it's really the only place that it grows in Orange County. There's been efforts to establish it at Balsa Chica. I don't think they've been successful, although I could be wrong on that. Um, this is really its, its location in Orange County. There's additional colonies up in Ventura and Santa Barbara County, and some nice big colonies in uh, central and southern San Diego County. Um, but its habitat is minimal. There's not a lot of habitat left in California. And so uh, Upper Newport Bay is a really important location. There is some speculation that the plants that are growing at Upper Newport Bay might be distinct from those that are in San Diego County or in the Ventura, Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo colonies. Um, there's some slight differences in their characteristics. And so somebody who wants to do a master's or a doctorate thesis, this would be a, a, a good candidate um, to do some genetic work and, and see if this really is a, a different taxa. But currently, um, it's salt marsh bird's beak. And a really important one to point out uh, if you're involved in interpretation to other people. It is protected. It shouldn't be bothered, shouldn't be sampled uh, without um, permission. Really cool plant. Pollinated by bees. Even though it's out in the marsh, native bees do the pollination of this. Um, really cool plant. Oh, and it really important, it's a hemi parasite. So the daughter in the last slide is a parasite. It has no chlorophyll. It relies completely on its host for everything. This one's a partial parasite. It creates a root, a root connection to its host, which might be salt grass or pickleweed or jamia or frankinia or some of the other ones we just mentioned. 
some of those salt marsh plants. It connects uh, below the soil line through a root connection, but it does also produce some of its own food through its own chlorophyll. So it has green leaves, it's producing some food for itself, but it's also robbing water and nutrition from its host. And those are called hemiparasites, um, or you could call them semi-parasites. So kind of neat. So it has a relationship with its host and it requires that host. It really can't persist on its own without um, a connection to, uh, to its host. All right, we've got a couple more and then we'll, we'll pause. Um, in the coastal salt marsh, these are rushes. Rushes are often very confusing for people, so we won't try to identify them here. Uh, people get um, very blurry when we talk about cattails and rushes and, and reeds and so on, but we have quite a few different species of um, um, at the bay. So most one of the more common ones is this one called Bulbashonus melitimus, alkali rush, and it grows right along the margins of uh, the marsh. We also have bulrush, another one of the confusing ones. These are generally a little larger than the rushes. And we've got basically two species. They're called Shonaplectus. And the two species are pulled from the two photographs at the bottom most easily. Uh, one has a pointed tip and one uh, doesn't. And they have different flower structures. They also have a difference in their leaf, uh, which you can see there in the top middle. If you were to cut a leaf, they have a different cross section but we'll just call them bulrushes. And they're important for um, a lot of bird species for cover and nesting. Another similar looking plant that has um, a degree of rarity uh, are uh, the juncus. And this one is juncus acutus. And it's a subspecies of that one called Leopoldii. And it's called Mexican rush. It's very easy to tell as you're looking out over the marsh. It'll grow in the intertidal areas, but it'll grow a little bit upland and a little bit above the water line as well. And it's very characteristic by these big spiny round masses. When there's a lot of them growing close together, um, it looks like just a big field of spiny um, grass-like growth, but you can usually see that round structure. They're fairly uncommon in California, lots of them at the bay though. And so they have a, a rare plant ranking, which is a, a rank that uh, rare plants are given. Uh, and easy to tell, they have a round foliage. They're, they're a little bit sharp to the touch, not too bad. They bend if you, brush up against them, but they'll poke you a little bit. And they grow about a meter and a half or so high, four or five feet high and six feet or so wide when, when they're full grown. And then we have the salt grasses that I mentioned also in the coastal strand. So I won't talk about that one too much. We actually have two species of salt grasses and they're sort of similar one with real short stubby foliage and one with longer, more Bermuda grass-like foliage. And they grow in similar habitats and they're true grasses. And then we have the, the sea lavenders. And this is the good guy. Um, they have those big broad leaves that really stand out in the salt marsh. It's really easy to pick this plant out there's nothing else with the leaf that's this size. Um, so the leaves can be a foot long and three or four inches wide, big juicy green. They are halophytes, which we'll mention in a minute, meaning that they can handle salty environments. And they, their strategy to deal with that salt is to crystallize the salt on the surface 
of the leaf, which you can see there at the top right. Salt's really toxic to plants. Um, so plants have different strategies. This one exudes the salt and it uh, pushes the salt out through the, some glands on the leaves. It's our only native sea lavender in California and it grows what at the upper intertidal zone. So the kind of a high tide mark is where you're gonna find it. Unfortunately, we have some really bad guys that a lot of the biologists have been working on and a lot of the volunteers and Newport Bay Conservancy has been strategic in working on this one. We have two invasive, actually three, but the two on the left are the primary issues. Um, two invasive uh, sea lavenders that are have much smaller leaves. Uh, the plants are generally under six inches uh, in width. The leaves are generally a, a couple of inches and they're little tufts of, of growth. Little, you can see that one in my hand there, just little, little, little mounds of foliage. Um, and they can be really, they're, they're very problematic. Uh, the seed floats at high tide, it's dispersed around the bay into new areas through the tide and they're prolific. They're annuals for the most part and they seed prolifically and they kind of crowd out the rest of the salt marsh plants. The species on the right isn't too problematic, but it's around. You'll see it occasionally, especially in Big Canyon. And I think I'll do this and then we'll break. Uh, I mentioned halophytes a couple of times, so we'll talk a bit more about that. A halophyte is a plant that can tolerate salts and salty soil and salty air, um, usually both. And there's some different strategies. One is they exude those salts through their leaves. And I mentioned that in that first sea lavender, showed a photograph of it. Another method is that they can isolate those salts inside of the leaf. Um, they can actually take those salt crystals, put them into uh, little chambers inside the leaf called vacuoles um, and kind of shut them off from the rest of the plant. And those are your pickle weeds and, um, and uh, ice plants particularly. And a third way is they can uh, excrete those salts. Um, uh, actually, I apologize, I misread that first one. The excretion of the salts is uh, the example that I mentioned in the sea lavender, where the salt moves all the way through the plant, it's absorbed by the root, goes through the plant, and the plant excretes it, um, usually through its leaf surface as a crystal. And those are the sea lavenders and the salt bushes are good examples. If you were to lick a salt bush leaf, you would taste the salt. If you were to lick a sea lavender leaf, I don't know that I recommend it, but you would get a salty taste. That's because the salts are on the surface of the leaf. The first one, let me mention that again, is um, they exclude the salts through membranes near the, near the root tips that don't allow the salt crystals through, um, uh, through that membrane and don't allow those salt crystals into the plant. So those are the three strategies that halophytes use. We have all three of them um, uh, use the strategies of the plants at Upper Newport Bay and the salt marsh and the coastal strand and in some of the other plant communities. And there's a whole example of what some of those native plants are that use those strategies at the bay. And I think I'm not going to talk about that one. And I'm going to stop here for a minute. I'm going to unmute some people if I can figure out how to do that. OK. 
Hillary, I might need you to help me. I can't seem to find the unmute button. I think I just did it. So um, anyone should okay. be able to cool. unmute themselves now. Okay. So we'll stop and entertain any confusions, any questions, any comments from any of you. Ron, I have a question. Is the she rocket okay. mm -hmm, at the coastal strand? Is the she rocket non native and not invasive? So the sea rocket is non-native and it is invasive. And um, you know, you you mentioned two terms there that are important to know. So lots of plants are non-native. We have a lot of those probably in our gardens. Um, and uh, that's all non-native means. It just means that it's not a plant that naturally uh, evolved here. Um, where an invasive plant is a plant that's moved into native habitat, into our natural areas, and is reproducing there. Um, and there are different degrees of invasiveness. Not all plants are as invasive. But, uh, but to answer your question, yes, the sea rocket is non-native, and it's also invasive. Great question. Any others? Going, going. Anybody else have a question or a comment or confusion? Ron? Ron? Yes, Peter. How are you? Peter Bryant. <laughs> I'm good. Um, How are you, Peter? I just had a question from the back row here. Um, is Yerba Monza native? What's yes, difference? it is. Yerba Monza, I think I'll have a slide on that one coming up here. Yerba Monza is um, a sprawling a uh, vining-like plant that grows right along the soil in damp areas. Um, really iconic when you see it. It looks like nothing else. And we've got some colonies of it at Big Canyon and a little further um, north uh, along uh, that same corridor. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is a very much a native. It was used a lot by Native Americans for various ailments and teas and in fact, it's um, Native Americans still use it, and as well as a few others. Great question. Well, I have another question. <laughs> have, have you noticed um, changes in the uh, populations of, of pollinators for any of the plants you're interested in? I'm sorry, a, a change in, say that one more time. In, in the populations of, of pollinators, is, um, as has been reported in other parts of the world. Um, does that give you any worries? Well, yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the relationship between plants and, and insects is um, pretty strong and in some cases um, obligate. It's a one to one relationship. Um, and so, um, as non native invasives, take more and more of the land mass and such, it often crowds out the native plants. When you lose the native plants, you start unraveling the trophic levels that are built upon that layer of mm -hmm. plant material. So if you lose a plant, in some cases, you may lose the pollinator. Um, by the way, that works vice versa as well. So, yes, we're just to. Ex I'm not an expert, and Peter, you can correct me on this, but um, the concept of trophic levels is important in understanding ecology. So, the foundation of a lot of the biodiversity often starts with the vascular plants, then, the vascular plants support another layer of the biomass, which are often the insects and the pollinators. And then those are supported by either perhaps birds or herbivores or 
reptiles or amphibians. And then those are in turn supported by a smaller group. And often those are the apex uh, predators. In many cases, the, the birds of prey or the coyotes or the fox or things like that. So if things unravel at the bottom of that pyramid, they unravel all the way, the entire pyramid starts to come apart. And so, yes, if we lose maybe plant diversity, then we start losing pollinators, then we start losing uh, the bird life, then we start losing the apex predators and everything crumbles. And I, Peter, I think, is, that reasonably, is that reasonably close? Sure. And I think the other thing that it's important to bear in mind, especially if you're, um, you know, introducing these topics to, to new people is um, that, uh, you know, the reason that all these flowers exist is to attract the pollinators. Um, at least that's my understanding of it. Maybe you have a different <laughs> view of it, but that's, that's why the flowers <laughs> are there. <laughs> and um, so uh, I think it's interesting to think about which came first, the flowers or insects. Do you know the answer? Well, I think it's probably, it was probably a dance. It's probably, you know, one interacting with the other. And I, I suspect an ecologist would argue that, you know, evolution is this sort of constant back and forth interaction between uh, the plant and the pollinator. So, um, you know, I, I would think that that is, I don't know that there's really a which came first. I don't, you know, the chicken or the egg. I, I think <laughs> in terms of plants and pollinators, um, at least the flowering, um, the flowering plants, I, I suspect that evolution kind of was um, simultaneous. Or it could have been that wind pollination was well established and, and then um, insects uh, were able to improve on that. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. When you're looking at, you know, when you're looking at a showy plant and, and, you know, we think it's for our benefit, of course, that showiness and, you know, those petals and those colors and all of that is, is, um, a sexual trick to attract that pollinator. Mm. The plants that are wind pollinated generally don't have very showy flowers, or if they do, it's accidental. Um, so grasses and such, which are wind pollinated, um, you know, don't need to spend their energy on showy flowers, where a daisy does. Good comment. Good question. Any others? Okay. Hi, uh, Ron, I was wondering, are the halophytes, are, do they um, have to have salt or can they, can they grow in, a, in, a, in, in an environment without salt? It's a great question. I, for the most part, most of them can grow without salt. Um, they don't really have a use for salt. It's more of a, an adaption to get rid of that salt. So they don't have any use for it. Um, you can grow pickleweed in your garden if you prefer um, and, or, and, and provide you know, the right moisture and soil and so on. So yeah, no, generally they don't really have to have salt, but, they can, but they're tolerant of it. Okay, that's good to know Great in course. case we want to put it in our gardens or I, they're very pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Great. Any others? All right. Shall we keep plowing along or do you want to uh, stand up for three or four minutes and stretch? I think we'll plow along then. And if you want to stretch, you can do that on your own. Um, but um, so that we finish on time, we'll, we'll keep moving. We're about the halfway point. 
Okay, so the next plant community are the bluffs that surround the bay. And we call those, that community, the coastal bluff scrub. And it's really a subset of coastal sage scrub, which we'll mention as well. And I think most of you are familiar with coastal sage scrub. Um, so, you know, all these cool environmental characteristics, same, a lot of the same things, um, but no intertidal, no, not much soil moisture, uh, no flooding, uh, no periodic flooding like we have in the marsh uh, or even the coastal strand. Um, and characteristic plants, but let's just kind of look at some of that habitat. So bluff scrub looks a lot like coastal sage scrub, um, but, but they're facing an ocean or a water body. Um, and I've got some Dudleya there on the bottom right and uh, Opuntias and things like that. Okay, so here's some of the characteristic plants of bluff scrub, um, as well as coastal sage scrub. Many of these cross over, like I mentioned. Um, that plant there on the top left is one of the most characteristic, uh, Artemisia californica or sagebrush, California sagebrush, not to be confused with sage. That's a completely different plant, it's a sagebrush. Um, let's look at some of them more carefully. This one's a nice fun one to point out when you're at the bay. Um, you'll see it popping out of the coastal bluff scrub. It's a true cactus, Solyndropuntia, and has a small purple flower that isn't, isn't terribly noticeable, but is there. It's a, it's a choya. Um, so it is a um, plant that has uh, stems that are easily dislodged, and that's its primary means of propagation. And uh, if you were to brush up against a cylindropuntia, uh, you would first um, go ouch and, and jump, and then you would look down and you would see uh, this thing attached to you, and it's one of those joints. It's uh, one of those um, sections that is dislodged and is sticking into your clothing or more like or worse into your skin. Um, and that's how it moves itself around. Um, if an animal were to do that, it would, it would do the same thing. If a mule deer walked up, it would potentially uh, dislodge onto the deer. The deer would walk a little ways and then rub it off and it would fall to the ground. It would root and you would have another Solidropuntia. That's vegetative reproduction. There's no flower involved. So this plant moves around in both manners by flower and seed, but actually more through vegetative reproduction through these stem pieces being dislodged and traveling um, and rerouting. That's true for um, a lot of cactus species. They're more commonly distributed vegetatively than through flowers. Um, another plant that's pretty um, easy to notice at the bay are bladder pods. Um, they bloom most of the year. Uh, they're in bloom right now. Um, a bright yellow flower in a, an odd family called Cleomaceae. Um, they have an interesting association with the harlequin bug, which is that little um, bug-like, well, it's not bug-like, it is a bug, it's a true bug, it's not a beetle. Um, and I don't know if there's really a strong connection or uh, to that harlequin bug, but I often see them uh, together. I don't know that the plant receives any benefit from their association, um, but the harlequin bug sure likes them. I almost always see them. Um, it has a, a dis, a, I'd say a disagreeable odor, but it has an odd odor. So when you're around the plant next time you are at the bay and you see it, 
rub it, rub the leaf a little bit, and then see what you think. Um, it's an odd fragrance. It's not terribly disagreeable, but it's characteristic. It's, it's interesting. A really cool plant for pollinators because it blooms much of the year. And um, a pretty good garden plant too, if you don't mind the fragrance, uh, just because it blooms a lot. If you like natives in your garden and you're into that, it's one, it's a nice one to have because it'll bloom right through the summer and into the fall. So that's bladder pod. It's about, usually you see them about a meter, sometimes big ones, two meters tall and kind of bushy. Okay, the related habitat to coastal bluff scrub is coastal sage scrub. Very much the same, but generally not on bluffs uh, facing the ocean or the bay, um, usually a little bit milder uh, slopes. And a lot of the same plants, so we can kind of do them together. These are various locations around the county. This is probably, on average, what was a growing where your house is probably sitting now. Um, more often than not, most of the places where we put houses are places that used to be coastal sage shrub because they're fairly coastal. They're not too steep. Um, they have, they're mild in terms of their climate. Um, so a lot less of this habitat than we used to have. And it's characterized by herbaceous plants, very few trees, um, virtually no trees. Um, the plants are often summer deciduous, at least to some degree. So unlike Eastern uh, habitats in, in the in colder climates, um, our coastal sage scrub becomes dormant in the summer and grows in the winter. And that's due to our mild climate and our winter rainfall and lack of summer rainfall, where uh, East Coast climates have opposites of that. They have cold winters, they have rainy summers, um, and so their plants behave um, opposite of that. So in Mediterranean climates and in our area, we have some degree of summer dormancy and winter growth. And that's how this plant community behaves. Um, very fragrant plants uh, in, in foliage. Um, if you go for a walk through coastal sage scrub, you're gonna notice the fragrance. And when you come home, it will come with you. It will be on your clothes. And it's really a delightful um, component, uh, component of the coastal sage scrub community. Very resinous, aromatic, um, odors. Some of the plant material that you probably will know pretty well because this is a, a really um, uh, fairly common community around in our area. Um, so some of these, uh, some of the sages, uh, white sage is um, iconic. Laurel sumac is one of the larger shrubs in the coastal sage shrub community. It's, almost tree-like, but not really. Lemonade berry is similar, um, large shrubs. We mentioned some of the choyas and cactus, um, and we have a lot of invasives in, in this community too, including the fennel on the bottom row there. So I mentioned this one. This is probably the most um, characteristic plant of coastal sage scrub, uh, the California sagebrush. Very fragrant, very aromatic. It is to some degree summer deciduous. It is herbaceous, doesn't have a lot of wood to it. Um, and another characteristic of this plant community is that they're shallow rooted. Um, generally, the roots don't go very deep, they tend to grow quite wide, um, well past the canopy of the plant, but generally not very deep into the soil. So this plant has all the characters that we mentioned of a, of a coastal sage shrub plant. Some, a couple of interesting 
notes about this plant, particularly at the bay. We have different color forms of this plant at Upper Newport Bay. Uh, we have a very silvery um, foliage morph um, version of the plant. And we have a more typical kind of gray green, kind of greenish um, uh, form of the plant. And if you're out and you're looking at this plant, the next time I'd, I'd ask you to look more carefully and see if you notice those different colors. Um, they're often growing side by side, and it has not been explained uh, why we have these different morphs at Upper Newport Bay. Um, we also have the same thing happening a little bit at Crystal Cove and especially at Dana Point at the headlands. But it's, um, it's an odd situation where we have these two quite different looking plants growing side by side. And uh, to be, it'd be a great um, uh, research project for um, a student. Uh, probably the other characteristic plant of coastal sage scrub is California buckwheat. And this one not only is near the coast, but it ranges into our mountain foothills uh, fairly well. Um, very prolific. One of the more common plants in Orange County, along with the previous one, um, probably one of the most important pollinator plants in all of Southern California. I might, I might argue it, it, it is maybe the most important. It, it uh, serves a great diversity of pollinators, um, from beetles to flies to uh, certainly bees. Uh, and a lot of our native insects um, nectar on this plant. Butterflies, to some degree hummingbirds, although the flower structure isn't quite right for them. But really cool plant. I encourage you to try it in your garden. Um, I would like to see it more common in gardens. Uh, it would bring pollinators into your garden. Um, and it's really adaptable to gardens. It, it can tolerate um, more moisture than a lot of native plants and it can tolerate all, all sorts of soil types and, and it's really rugged. If you do decide to try it in your garden, I would encourage you to try a selection called Dana Point that Tree of Life Nursery grows. Um, it's more compact and more floriferous and has a nice, sort of better habit than the um, the normal selection, the wild selection. So there you go. That's uh, California buckwheat. It's also a lot of the same characters, shallow rooted, uh, reasonably summer deciduous, but um, really long bloom period and um, really a beautiful plant. And there is what it looks like in the late fall uh, on the far right there, and it's sort of its semi deciduous season. And there it is in full bloom on the left with sagebrush interspersed. And there's uh, one of its uh, pollinator hosts um, at the bottom. Peter, which, uh, well, Peter, you're, you're muted. You'll tell me later which, which butterfly that is. And then Probably the third most characteristic plant of sage scrub is the other, uh, is one of our sages, uh, black sage. Um, very common uh, all over Orange County, up into the chaparral, not quite in chaparral, but almost, and all the way to the coast, and reasonably common at Upper Newport Bay. Um, all the same characteristics, some are deciduous. Um, resinous foliage, fragrant, uh, herbaceous. Uh, this one though is also a good pollinator for hummingbirds and bumblebees. Bumblebees, uh, which are buzz pollinators, um, are uh, great pollinators for this plant. The, the, the introduced honeybee visits it. And of course, a lot of the honey that we get uh, in the stores comes from this plant, sage, 
but it doesn't do a very good job of pollinating it. It it robs the nectar, but it uh, but native I'm sorry, but uh, European honeybees aren't very successful at um, actually uh, uh, doing pollination. So the, so the point there, just because you see honeybees visiting plants, don't always confuse that with them providing an ecological service called pollination. Um, some bees, even native bees, rob the nectar, but don't uh, perform pollination. And that's true uh, oftentimes with our, with our European honeybees. Um, so uh, a really showy plant at the bay and in a lot of coastal areas is our coastal sunflower called Encilia californica. Um, repeat again, ditto, all the same things. It's sort of summer deciduous. Um, for that reason, it's not a great garden plant. It looks pretty scruffy uh, right about now. Um, and it gets rather large in, in a garden. It can uh, take up a lot of space. But uh, when, it's in, when it's in full bloom, beginning in sometimes late January and all through uh, mid spring, it is um, a nonstop show of flowers and really colorful, big daisy like flowers. And there's a honeybee visiting it. One of the things that I'd like to mention is um, um, hybridization. And we have a, a, an interesting hybridization event that's been going on at Upper Newport Bay for a decade or two at least. And that's um, hybridization of two encilias. The native encilia is the one I just showed you. And it's encilia californica, California state, um, sunflower, coastal sunflower. And not too long ago, uh, in the last couple of decades, another encilia was introduced called encilia farinosa. That's a species that grows in our deserts. It is a native of California, but it's not a coastal native. It grows in Palm Springs. You'll see it all over the slopes and the hillsides. So we have those two species in California, but naturally they would never really see each other. One would be growing in the deserts and one would be growing on the coast and they'd never be able to, um, to wave at each other. But uh, humans like to move things around, so we brought, for one reason or another, we brought in Cilia farinosa to the coast and put it into gardens or restoration or just planted it for whatever reason. And now those two species are hybridizing. And at the bay, um, we'll find lots of hybrids of those two. Why is that important? Well, if the hybrids are really successful, they'll produce fertile um, seeds. If they're not successful, they'll be a mule, they'll have a hybrid, and that's the end of it. Um, but if they're close enough genetically, then they'll, uh, they'll be fertile hybrids. And so that's what's happening at the Bay. We've got our native, we've got our desert species, they're hybridizing, they're producing a, uh, a plant that then crosses again with the native species, that's called a back cross, producing another fertile offspring. That one crosses again with the native, producing another fertile offspring, and that continuum just goes on and on and on, and that's called genetic introgression, and it's a form of continual back crossing of uh, hybrids. And if you took that to a, as, as extension, what that means potentially is that you could lose the native species uh, and it could turn into something um, altogether different. And whether that will ever happen with this species is conjecture, but we are seeing um, that hybridization 
and the caution that uh, you want to be careful moving native plants around, uh, even in gardens and certainly in restoration sites. We want to keep natives native to their area of nativity and be careful moving them into areas where they're not locally native or we can wind up with some of this hybridization. Um, so anyway, that's my lesson there. Uh, as if you're at the bay, you'll see that occasionally, if you look hard, you might find some nearly pure uh, insilia. It has the gray leaf, most easily seen in the top right photo. And our native local one has a pure green leaf. And then you'll see these things that are kind of in between. And those are the hybrids. So there you go, that's the lesson. Um, another really important plant at the bay and one that you probably should know, uh, one of the few in this presentation that I encourage you to remember is this one. And it's called Centromedia perii, a particular subspecies called Australis. And it's the Southern tar plant. And it's a plant that's not very well distributed uh, we are kind of ground central for it here in Orange County. And I would argue that Upper Newport Bay is kind of ground central in Orange County. It, it's, um, it's a protected plant. It's a, a really high rare plant ranking. It's a 1B1, which is um, very rare. And it's a little member of the daisy family. It's an annual. It sprouts in the spring, grows in the summer, and then fades away in late fall, dropping its seed until rain starts and the cycle happens again. Um, easy to find at the bay. Um, it is a plant that likes disturbance. So it likes to be along roadsides and it likes to be where people walk in, uh, and along trails. And so it actually needs that disturbance. Um, so you'll find it right along Back Bay Drive. If you drive, well, you can't drive right now, it's closed, but if you cycle or walk along Back Bay Drive, uh, it won't take you very long. You'll see this plant growing right along the edge of the roadway, right where people scuff along and cars uh, put their wheels once in a while. Um, that's what the plant likes. Um, 10 feet further off the roadway, you won't find any. You'll see it right along the disturbance. Um, so there you go. It has little, um, little sort of spiny leaves that are a little bit prickly to the touch. The flowers are about the size of a dime, bright yellow, daisy-like. They have ray flowers and and uh, and disc flowers, uh, which is typical of members of the aster family. Okay, the next habitat is um, much smaller, not very well represented at the bay, but we have a little bit of it. It's a fresh, um, there's a little bit of it at uh, Big Canyon that is um, sort of an interesting habitat, not really native. It was created, but um, been there for a few decades. So sort of natural now, uh, and we have a, bigger representation just outside of the bay um, up at the San Joaquin Freshwater Marsh, both in the public area and in the UC uh, private portion, just uh, half a mile or so uh, outside of the bay. So uh, it's a freshwater area with very little salt intrusion, um, year round moisture as opposed to vernal pools, which we also have in the county, which are seasonal. And uh, usually standing or, or slowly moving water, um, poorly aerated soil, and so on. The plants in these environments are semi-aquatic or aquatic, and they're generally evergreen. Um, so let's look at some of those. There they are, but let's look at them in picture form. Here's what freshwater marshes look like. We don't have a lot of freshwater marshes in Orange County because we're a Mediterranean climate. We don't have a lot of year-round moisture, uh, but we have a little bit. 
and San Joaquin Marsh. Uh, a couple of those pictures are our best example in the county. And it's just across Jamboree and MacArthur Boulevard, just up the bay. We have a little bit in Big Canyon that's um, almost impossible to access, um, but it's there. And it's mostly ingrown now with cattails and bulrush. Um, but there's a little bit of open water toward the center that it, you really can't access. And, but the mosquitoes can, mosquitoes love it. So plants of this environment, marsh primrose, some weeds like the perennial pepperweed is a huge problem. Um, we've got a little aquatic fern uh, on the top right. That's actually a floating plant that is a, uh, a fern, um, not a flowering plant. And then uh, a real common plant that you will see right along Backway Drive, where we've got some standing water from urban runoff. You'll see this little plant called duckweed growing in the, in the irrigation, or not the irrigation, but in the little uh, overflow areas. Uh, one of the smallest plants in the world. Uh, each one of those little dots on my finger is a full plant. It has a flower, it has a seed, and it's about two millimeters across the leaf. So a little tiny thing. And it's a full aquatic, it floats on the water surface. So those are all examples of freshwater marsh plants. Here's the plant that uh, Peter uh, mentioned earlier. And it's a native. It's uh, called Yerba Manza or also called lizard tail. It's a sprawling plant that grows as an understory in riparian communities and freshwater marsh communities. It needs moisture in the soil. It won't grow too far from uh, damp areas. And it has a really odd, strange compound flower. Um, actually, each one of those are individual flowers, each one of those little white. Um, if you look at the photograph toward the middle right, each one of those is actually an individual flower. Um, and it's actually in a different phenological group as well, which probably doesn't matter. It's called, a, it's in a group called magnolias. So it's not a unicot, it's not a dicot, it's not a, it's like none of those. It's in its own um, very old uh, prehistoric um, plant group. Uh, but you'll find it at Upper Newport Bay and under the canopy in Big, at, uh, at Big Canyon and a little bit up toward uh, East Bluff, uh, down below East Bluff in the damp understory um, under the willows. You really can't miss it. This big round uh, oval uh, leaf um, growing as an understory right along the soil. And I mentioned that Native Americans and even some people today still use it as homeopathic remedies for all sorts of issues. You can see those kind of listed down there on the bottom. Um, so it's a sacred plant to certain Native American plant communities, or, uh, Native American communities. A real showy plant of freshwater marshes is this one called Pluchia uh, or salt marsh fleabane. Uh, when people see it, they just they always want to take a picture of it or ask me what it is. Um, has this really colorful flower and it blooms really late in the season. It's a late summer and fall flowering plant. So it's in flower when lots of other plants have already finished. It's a member of the daisy family, but it doesn't have any ray flowers, just disc flowers, just the central flowers. And it grows about three feet, four feet tall when it's happy. And it always has its feet near moisture. Can't tolerate dryness. Oh, darn. Well, yeah, Brazilian pepper. 
Um, it's another plant through freshwater marsh, but I'm going to save that for later because I'm going to talk about it at the end. Riparian woodland is, I think, maybe the last plant community that's just slightly represented at Upper Newport Bay. It's a year round moisture. It's mostly known by our mountain canyons and foothill canyons where um, there's stream flow um, that um, has year round water. That water might be at the surface or it might be under the surface, but there's some degree of moisture available um, year round. And at, in our area at the bay, or near the bay, we might have a little bit of it uh, in, well, we certainly have some of it in Big Canyon and a little bit over at the uh, 23rd Street drainage over near Irvine Boulevard. Um, if you were to go a little bit further up the watershed, you would find uh, a lot of it at, in San Diego Creek Channel along the margins of the channel. Um, just past the Jamboree and MacArthur Bridges and uh, east from there. It's dominated by um, uh, winter deciduous trees. So trees that actually drop their leaves in the winter and are evergreen, or pardon me, that are um, uh, leafed in the summer months. And that's because they, ha they have year round moisture. Um, where the few areas with summer water in a Mediterranean climate. Lots of these don't exist very well at Newport Bay, but these are some iconic plants of riparian woodlands. The Humboldt lily um, is up in our mountain canyons. Uh, the stream orchid is a fun one to find. It's one of our native orchid species. Um, and of course, it, things like our native maple, um, alders, um, sycamores as well, uh, bay trees and so on. It's also um, the main plant community for poison oak. We do have poison oak at Upper Newport Bay uh, in a few places. And I've got about 15 minutes or so left. So I'm gonna use some of that time to talk about non-native invasive plants, particularly as they relate to the bay, because they're a major component of the plant community at the bay. Whether we like it or not, if you remember back to the, one of those first slides, um, about half the species, a little bit more than half of all of the plant species at the bay are non-native. Um, they're naturalized plants. So we need to understand those. So a non-native invasive plant is an, in, is an invasive alien species introduced by man into places that aren't in their normal range of distribution. For them to be invasive though, they have to become established and disperse and have a negative impact on the local ecology. And the second statement there is surprising to a lot of people, um, but non-native invasive plants represent the second most significant cause of species extinction in the world. Uh, it's only habitat destruction that causes more species extinction. So when we're, when we're talking about ecology and environmental protection, um, let's be sure that we include the huge impact on plant extinction and species extinction from the threat of non-native invasive plants. They crowd out our native plants, which as we mentioned earlier, then the whole ecology starts to unravel. Um, once the plants are gone, lots of other things start to go away as well. So 
there we go, introduced by man out of their natural range, negative impacts. Those are invasive plants. Don't confuse that with, um, you know, your roses in your garden. Uh, those are fine. They don't, they're not gonna move into the bay. This, is, this sort of explains uh, graphically a little bit about uh, how to understand invasive plants and how they cause trouble over time. Um, this is called the invasion curve. And it's not only true with plants, it can be used for mollusks or invasive mammals or any other invasive organism. So on the far left side of that, the, the invasive organism doesn't exist in that area. And then it gets introduced. There's very little um, area infested. So it's very low on the axis. And then over time, that organism starts reproducing. It generally, if it's, if it's, a, um, if it's a, 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 a significant invader, it will outcompete its native partners, it doesn't have any controls in its new environment. Uh, and so it starts outcompeting the native um, members of that plant community. And it continues to expand. At the same time, the native plant community starts to contract and its population starts moving up that curve. Eventually, it will start to uh, stabilize as it runs out over available habitat and the curve starts to flatten up at the top right. Um, the point that I want to make here is that from a management standpoint, we really only have um, a small window of time and to, to, uh, to deal with that, those, these new invasive plants. And that's over on the far left-hand side of that invasion curve. Um, if a new species gets into the bay and we find a handful of them, that's the time to jump on it very quickly, remove those, monitor, survey for additional, and stay active on that organism for the next few years. If we don't, the plant will move up that curve to a point in which there's really no possibility of eradicating it. And at that point, we're just having to manage it and live with it. As an example of that, I was over by the 23rd Street uh, drainage today over on the uh, north side of the bay uh, just a few hours ago and found an invasive plant. Uh, only the first time I've seen it at the bay, uh, it's a little shrub called Cesbania. Uh, found one plant. It's about two feet tall, no flowers, no fruit, uh, which is good. It's just not reproducing yet. A single plant. I reported it to Nathan at Orange County Parks, uh, and it'll get removed. Um, that from that one single plant, that, that by the way, that plant is a known uh, invader. Uh, it can cause a lot of havoc. If that plant doesn't get removed and uh, it starts seeding around, uh, we could be here in another 20 years spending an enormous amount of money and energy trying to manage it. So uh, that's a real life example. So it's right there on the farthest left side of that graph as could be. And if we don't get rid of it there, it'll just keep climbing up that curve very likely. So that's the invasion curve. Really cool thing to understand and explain to people. Here's another example of a plant at the bay. This got a lot of publicity four or five years ago when it first showed up. It was discovered on March 31st. Well, it was rediscovered actually 
um, uh, in 2015 uh, by a gal named Barbara Bothling, who was looking at birds and saw this plant and sent me a picture and said, I don't know this plant, what is it? And I didn't know what it was either because that's the nature of new invasives. We don't know what they are. They don't, they've never been seen here before. But we figured it out and found out that it was the second occurrence for North America. And it's one of the most problematic invasives in the world. So uh, the city of Newport Beach, Newport Bay Conservancy, the Irvine Ranch Conservancy, which was doing management in the Bay at the time, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, maybe in Orange County Parks and maybe even others immediately collaborated and have been working on it for the last five years. And it'll be another 20 years until we can um, probably say that we're successful in eradicating it, but we're hoping we can uh, make that claim at some point. We're pulling it and managing it as much as the resources will allow. Um, when I say rediscovered, come to find out, the plant was first found at Upper Newport Bay in 1987, but it was misidentified. And a sample was taken, it was sent to UC Riverside. None of the smart people at the time knew what it was. So it just got put into the herbarium and kind of filed away with the wrong name on it. And um, three years ago, we rediscovered that sample at UC Riverside and found out it was actually this plant. So it's actually been at the bay since 1987, but uh, nobody knew it was knew it was there until 2015 when Barbara brought it to our attention. Interesting story. It, there's um, kind of an outline of uh, part of the population at the bay. And there's a little bit more about what it looks like uh, from a uh, um, handout sheet that the Native Plant Society produced. And a little bit more about what, to, what it looks like. If you see this plant, uh, you want to tell uh, uh, somebody, the park people, or send me a note, or post it on CalFlora or iNaturalist if you're using either of those platforms. And believe me, we will, we will see your post. Uh, if you find it somewhere outside of where we already know it is, um, we'd love to know. We know that it's at Big Canyon and we know it's over along Irvine Boulevard. Um, but if you find it outside of those two areas, we sure want to know. We have invasive trees at Upper Newport Bay. And um, the poster child for that one is this one, Brazilian pepper. Um, that's what it looks like. It's the subject of a very expensive restoration that's going on that I'm sure you all know about at Big Canyon. This is more of what it looks like. Uh, those photographs at the right are inside the canopy at Big Canyon. And on the left is kind of the outer edge of the invasion. It's a terrible thing. It's just absolutely terrible. It's a dead zone. Um, it supports virtually no biodiversity. It's green. And that's about its only redeeming quality. Um, it creates a monoculture of nothing else. It's, it has allopathic properties, meaning it sort of sterilizes the soil so that nothing else beneath it can compete with it. It causes erosion problems. It's just a giant beast. And uh, fortunately, Peter and the great people at the Conservancy have taken the leadership to uh, manage the largest problem, which is at Big Canyon. And 
This is a recent picture of um, what it looks like at Big Canyon. It's causing erosion. There's no other growth happening. I should say also, if you were to walk into that forest, which, uh, which I've done several times, and you were to be still and just listen and look, you'd find almost nothing. You'd, you'd hear no life and you'd see no life. There's no pollinators, virtually no pollinators. There's no bird life. There's um, no mammals, no herbivores. There's no, there's nothing. It's just a dead zone because um, it didn't evolve here. And it's pollinators and cohabitants are somewhere in South America where the plant came from. It's a real biodiversity dead spot. This is what's happening. If you haven't been to Big Canyon uh, in the last month, uh, it's very exciting time. After lots of um, work and lots of fundraising and environmental permitting and collaboration, um, that Brazilian pepper forest is in the midst of being removed as we speak. Uh, so this is about a month ago, uh, some of the clearing that's going on, that's the forest behind it, and some of the cutting and removal. It's a huge project. And this is what happens if a new invasive species moves in and it doesn't get dealt with quickly. Um, you wind up with these millions of dollars of projects. So the forest is being turned into this and for the most part being hauled off and it will be replaced with uh, a native tapestry of locally native species. And in a few years uh, or less, we'll be able to go to Big Canyon and see a very biodiverse, very healthy ecosystem with uh, native pollinators, native insects, native mammals, native birds, um, and a whole healthy ecosystem happening rather than a, a fairly dead spot right now. And that's kind of where I'm going to end and we'll do a couple of questions and comments. But before we do that, here's my message about invasive plants. And I will say in, in full disclosure, um, invasive plants are one of my focuses in Orange County. I, I'm uh, one of the leaders of invasive plant detection and management challenges around the county. Um, so um, it's an area that I have a, a lot of personal interest. And with that, Holly, if you want to, um, um unmute everybody or hillary sorry if you want to unmute everybody we maybe can take a few questions i'm i've kind of hit my eight o'clock timeline but uh i'll stay for a few more minutes yeah um we did get a couple of questions come up through the chat um i'm not sure if those people would like to voice their own questions i did just allow everyone to unmute themselves um, if anyone wants to jump in and ask their question. I don't know who it was that asked, but I thought it was a good question. And that is whether that soil in Big Canyon still has the allelopathic chemicals in it and will they make it difficult to, to do the restoration project? It's a good question. And, and, uh, Daniel from UCI would be, a, uh, a, wish he was on, on the, the call or on the conference. But I, I talked to Daniel about it and he believes that the allelopathic chemicals are fairly short-lived in the soil. Um, the, 
his, his, uh, he's doing research on uh, allelopathic uh, challenges and particularly at helping with, um, with the Big Canyon project. But um, his, his belief is that um, they're, they're fairly short lived in the soil and uh, the restoration will be um, pretty successful. The chemicals are, are contributed to the soil through uh, leaf litter drop, as well as fruit drop from the canopy of the plant. So as the leaves fall, um, as the fruit drops, um, just from the normal growth of the plant, those chemicals um, move into the soil and create a toxic layer that inhibits seed germination. Um, for most other plants. So once that canopy is gone, then those chemicals are no longer being added to the soil. And um, hopefully we get some good rains and those chemicals uh, get neutralized. Good. What other questions do we have from the chat? Or, or live. Yeah, so um, Janet had asked, has there been any effort to remove the hybrid and cilia? Um, I'm not sure if that one was actually invasive, but. Well, it depends on our definition of invasive. Uh, it's not naturally native in this area. So um, yeah, I would probably lean toward calling it a an invasive in that respect. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and I think um, it's right now it's that, that would be a challenge. Um, the plants been in the area for long enough to where its genetics are already in the native population. So um, far as I know, there's been no efforts to remove the non-native sunflower in cilia. And it's a larger regional issue. It's not unique to Upper Newport Bay. Um, that non-native desert in cilia is also present lots of other places in Orange County. Um, not to throw anybody under the bus, but um, the plant has been used, unfortunately, in some misguided restorations, not at Upper Newport Bay, so no, no guilt there. Um, but some land managers um, um, decided a few decades ago to use this plant uh, along roadsides and in um, other restoration areas, not probably knowing the consequences. And now the horses left the barn so to speak. It's, there's too much of an Orange County to have it removed, but we don't want to add any more. Well, Ron, is there a good source of Encelia Californica that's pure? Are any of the oh, yeah. local nurseries producing yeah. it? Yeah, I, I, you know, people like Tree of Life uh, that, you know, really do a great job. Um, you know, there's still lots of what looks to be perfectly pure in cilia um, in Southern California. So as long as we're harvesting seed or taking cuttings from uh, pure stands, um, we're fine. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't probably go to Upper Newport Bay and collect some seed mm. and take it home and regrow it because we know that there's um, hybridization going on there. Mm. So we wouldn't want to. Um, bring those genetics, um, you know, and move them out of the bay. And, 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 and just to speak a, maybe a little bit more to that, there's, there's also um, the challenge of uh, just local genetics, um, not necessarily hybridization, but just local genetics. And it's a big concern amongst the native plant scientific world. Um, Let's take a plant like um, a toyon, which is everybody knows, a uh, real popular native shrub. 
um, it rose from San Francisco to Northern Baja. And so um, a homeowner says, well, gee, I want to do the right thing. I want to plant natives. Uh, great. And so they go buy a toy on uh, somewhere and they take it home and they plant the toy on and there were a few of them in their backyard. Um, and all sounds good. And to some degree it is good, but where did that toy on come from? If that toy on came from Monterey County where it certainly grows perfectly well. And uh, that nursery or that propagator, you know, took their cuttings there and then shipped their plants to uh, Orange County and the homeowner walked in and loaded up on half dozen toyons and put them in their backyard. Well, they're putting Monterey County genetics into their backyard. Even though it's the same species, there are subtle differences in the genetics of our population versus those in Monterey County. Well, now those genetics are gonna get blended and you're gonna wind up with something um, in between perhaps of those Monterey genetics and those Orange County genetics. And the plants that are evolved in Orange County have evolved to our particular soils, our particular nutrients, our particular soil biology and mycorrhizal associations perhaps. And, um, and that plant in Monterey may not have. And so the progeny of those crosses might not be as well suited to uh, Orange County. So you wind up with genetic pollution. So the, the message that I'm saying there, and, I'm, and when thin ice probably saying too much more, but the message that I'm saying there is that there's a debate in the native plant world uh, about pushing native plants too hard and without the right education. Um, if you just get in your car and drive out and buy a bunch of native plants and take them home and plant them on the hillside overlooking Upper Newport Bay, are you doing a good thing or a bad thing? And there's different schools of thought to that. One school of thought is, you know, oh, you know, just plant a bunch of uh, raffia lepus and, and roses and, uh, and geraniums because they're never going to cross with anything native and cause any trouble. That's a legitimate school of thought. Another school of thought is no, we need to, we need to have more native plants in, in our habitat because our whole ecosystem depends on them. But then we run the risk of bringing genetics in that damage the native plant populations through that um, hybridization that happens. So it's an interesting debate that I don't have an answer for. But but do be the, the message, the conclusion there is yes, plant natives that are locally sourced. That's the best message. If you if you want to support ecology, local ecology, yes, plant natives, but find out where they came from. And they should come from a local source. And, and by the way, that's what Newport Bay Conservancy and that's what all the restoration is that's going on. Um, you know, they're good ecologists like, like Alice and others, you know, are, are always insist that the plant material be from local genetics. Well, do you want to say something about where people can get those locally sourced plants? <clears throat> Well, I happen to work at a garden center, so I guess I should, <laughs> I should make a little plug. Uh, but you know, it, it really just you know, well, it depends if you on what you're buy selling. from if you buy from a responsible uh, garden center, um, and you know, Rogers Gardens is the company that I manage. So you know, we're very careful about where we source our native plants. The vast majority come from Tree of Life Nursery. Uh, 
which is, um, you all know, in San Juan Capistrano. So if you're not buying from Rogers Gardens, that's fine. Uh, go down to Tree of Life Nursery and get your plants there. Um, they're all locally sourced. Now, if you're gonna move to Monterey, don't get them from Tree of Life and drive up there. Buy them from a nursery that's sourcing locally up there. So just, yeah, buy locally sourced. If you're not sure, um, look at the label on the, on the can. If you're at a garden center and you can sort of tell, if you've got your phone, just look at the label that will have the name of the grower and you can pull your phone out, Google that grower, and you can find out where they're located. If, uh, if they're, you know, pretty coastal, local, you're probably okay. If they're an address in San Francisco, maybe not. Yeah. You might want to um, go shop somewhere else. Other questions? I can't get to the chat. I don't know how to do that. So I'm relying on, on you, Hillary, if there's anything else there. Um, Peter had actually brought up an interesting question about the bladder pod. Is the bladder the ovary? Yes. Well, hmm, no, 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 <laughs> that's not true. That, no, no, the, the bladder is just a loose covering um, outside of the ovary, uh, just a loose membrane. Now the ovary is inside of, if you open it up and uh, you'll find, I think it's two seeds, um, two ovaries inside that big bladder. Yeah. Great. Um, another question from the chat was, where does Volutaria uh, tubulophora come, originate from? It's from the Northern Mediterranean, uh, Greece and um, uh, parts of um, the Mediterranean basin. And how it got here is not certain, but we think we're pretty sure that it actually came via Chile, where it's not native. So Volutaria invaded Chile um, a while ago, a few decades ago, and has um, become a, an issue in Chile. And we think that it came from Chile to Newport Beach. Now, how it got here, nobody will ever know. And the reason we know that is that the particular form, the, it's very subtle, but the particular form that we see at Newport Bay is very rare in the Mediterranean. Um, there's very little of that particular form but it is the dominant form that is in Chile. So it, it almost certainly uh, invaded from, it moved from, the Europe, from Europe to Chile and then somebody perhaps was visiting Chile or vacationing or who knows how and it um, migrated from there to Newport Beach. And then the we have a huge population out in Borrego Springs in the Anza Borrego Desert. That's the biggest problem in the United States. And uh, we think that it moved from Newport Beach to Anza Borrego. Although we have a small population in Newport Beach, um, we're pretty sure it was in Newport Beach first and then it moved to Anza Borrego. In Newport Beach, it's cooler, it's more coastal. The plant's not quite as aggressive here. It doesn't spread too far. Um, and in Borrego Springs, it's out of control. It's covering about five or six square miles now. And the effort is uh, becoming more grave every year. There's, there's a lot of money and a lot of um, time being spent to try to get it out of Borrego Springs, but um, it's getting worse every year. Um, Ron, are the um, leaves from the Sea Rocket and Voluntaria very similar? No, the Sea Rocket's a succulent leaf. 
So it's a juicy leaf, like an ice plant kind of leaf. Um, and the volutaria is a flat, um, you know, more typical leaf. The volutaria is, um, wait, I'll try to go back, but uh, the volutaria is a dissected leaf. Oops, just passed it. There you go. So that's the leaf of the volutaria there um, on the bottom in my hand. So it has a lobed leaf, several lobes, and the sea rock, it's completely different. It's a much smaller leaf, like a little juicy ice plant. Memorize that leaf that you're seeing there. And if you see that, we want to know about it. And be careful, there are a few others that look similar. So, you know, be a little careful. I should mention two resources that I, or two or three resources that I haven't mentioned. Um, one of them you probably know called iNaturalist. Seems like everybody knows that now. I'm a big fan of iNaturalist. Um, you can find lots of images of all these plants by just using that app. Um, and it's really easy to use too. And it's a great way to share your information with people like me and, and others. Another one is Calflora and maybe not quite as well known, but from a plant standpoint, I strongly encourage that you uh, check out Calflora and kind of navigate and get comfortable with it. It's um, a little bit deeper into um, plants in California with distributions and better pictures and a little more science base. So strongly encourage you to check out those two online resources. They both have phone applications, they're easy to use and are excellent for plant mapping and distribution and identification. And then, um, you know, Dr. Bryant's website, the Natural History of Orange County is incredible because it's focused right here on Orange County. Um, definitely want to become familiar with that one. And um, the late Bob DeRuff uh, passed away about 10 years ago or so, um, has an incredible site called the Flora of Upper Newport Bay, which is just focused on the plants of the bay. And he spent a lot of time and a lot of energy producing an incredible resource um, documenting the plants of Upper Newport Bay. So those are all great resources. And, Anything uh, else? and an, uh, another great resource is the California Native Plant Society. Thank uh, you. That's my, uh, that's my home, uh, away from home, uh, is uh, uh, CNPS, particularly the Orange County chapter. So I encourage you to check us out too. And, are are um, they doing uh, virtual meetings or what, what, what's going on? Yeah, we're, we've, uh, we've resigned to the fact that we can't uh, meet in person. And so uh, each month we have a virtual presentation. We just did one on the plants of Crystal Cove State Park. Um, so yeah, check us out. And it's it's uh, their Zoom meetings um, and uh, join us for that. We're hoping to resume field trips next year, but we will see. Um, uh, maybe, you know, socially distanced field trips of some sort and hope to get back maybe into Upper Newport Bay with the field trips some, at some point during the year. But we'll, we'll wait, wait and see on that. One more question, Ron. Uh, now everybody's looking for interesting plants. What are the rules about picking flowers and bringing them to you for identification? Uh, don't do it is the, is the rule. Um, even, even myself. Um, so why? Well, all the lands are managed by somebody. If they're privately owned, we really want to respect those private landowners. If they're publicly managed by OC Parks or CDFA or whoever, um, we want their permission before we um, start taking uh, plants out of the ground. There's, and there's lots of reasons for that. 
Um, one is that we make mistakes and I've had that happen with people. They've pulled things out and shown me pictures and then I, ooh, that was actually a native plant that you just pulled out. Um, another reason is that uh, it, people, people will see you doing it and they don't always understand what you're doing. If uh, you're, you know, especially in an urban area like Upper Newport Bay, you're out there pulling mustards or whatever it is you're pulling. Um, other people see that and um, want to mimic you, but they might not have the same knowledge that you have. And, uh, and they might be pulling the wrong plant. And the third reason is it's the law. It, it's, it's the law. Um, you're not supposed to be taking plants without permission from uh, public areas. And basically all of our land managers have that, that, that ordinance, whether it's city, county, state, or otherwise. In fact, even the plant that I described earlier, which is invasive, that I saw at 23rd Street, it's still there. I left it because I don't have permission to pull it. I know exactly what it is. I know it's a bad guy, but I said to Nathan, I said, Nathan, you know, if you give me permission, I'll go back and pull it. Um, but, um, but, but it's really up to Nathan to make that decision. Um, so and Nathan's the resource manager for the Orange County Parks that handles the bay. So no, it's not a good idea to do. If you have permission, wonderful, but um, generally otherwise, no. And I, I do have permits in certain areas to do that. So, um, yeah, great question. Any others? Well, thank yeah. you, Juan, so much for your time. Um, uh, I don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you for staying on a little bit longer to address some of these questions. Um, everyone, we, as Ron mentioned at the beginning, we will be having our virtual plant walk on Saturday um, with Chuck Nichols and Pete Ridley. Um, that will be a Zoom uh, call again, so you should have received the link for that. Um, and then next week, uh, Peter Bryant, who you heard on this call, uh, will be talking about insects and spiders um, and a little bit about their global decline. Um, so kind of following up on our uh, plants and pollinators uh, talk from tonight. So those are your upcoming events. Um, another big thank you to Ron for being here and um, have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.